From Chicago, welcome to Three Degrees Discussions. I'm your host, Mike Vasquez. This is a podcast devoted to the stories behind the innovators, entrepreneurs, and leaders in the 3D printing industry. It's not replacing jobs. It's actually addressing a gap there is currently in the industry. In the U.S. alone, the, there is a workforce shortage, I believe, of around half a million people in the construction industry. Mm-hmm. And that means, and anybody, any listener here, if you've done a construction project recently, uh, it most likely got delayed. Um, it actually was that before COVID, the average construction time of a project was around four months, something like that. Post-COVID, it's around eight months. That's Philip Lund Nelson. Philip is the co-founder of Cobot International, a global leader in 3D construction printers with investors like GEE, Holseam, Semex, and the Perry Group. He manages the company's activities in North and Latin America. Before we get started, head over to www.3degreescompany.com and subscribe to the podcast. Remember, you can listen to the show anywhere you download your podcast, including Spotify, Apple, Amazon, or Stitcher. Also, if you or your company are looking for materials, qualification, or general admin manufacturing support, reach out to the team through our website or via email at info at 3degreescompany.com. All right, Philip, thanks so much for joining the show today. Uh, excited for the conversation we haven't had. Well, actually, this will be our second 3D printing and construction uh, conversation, but um, I like to get started with all the guests um, more kind of personally. So where where did you grow up? Um, what was kind of early life like and and what got you on the path towards what you're doing now yeah good to see you mike and, and thanks for uh, for having me on the show uh my name is philip and uh i'm co-founder of, of cobot international and, and we supply 3d printers for the construction industry uh, right now i'm i'm i live in the states i moved here uh earlier in the year uh, but i grew up in a small town north of uh copenhagen denmark that's where I'm from. I won't pronounce the name and you won't be able to look it up either because uh, it's, it's a very small town, uh, but it's close to Copenhagen, our capital. Um, what led me to where I am today, well, it sort of took its, um, it, it, the first steps for when I was in, in college. Um, I, uh, I actually dropped out of college because I, I had an, an illness and um, I got a call from, uh, from my uncle at this time asking me if I wanted to test out a plastic, a small scale 3D printer. This was back in, I believe, 2013, 2014, to which I replied, hey, what is a 3D printer? Um, and, uh, so I got, through, uh, uh, I got through a few of these. I couldn't get them to work. But on the fifth one, I was really taken back by being able to 3D print this iPhone cover, like a very simple shape. shape. And I was just so amazed by the fact that you could take a 3D model, something digital, and turn it into the physical world. Um, so just to cut the sh- uh, story short, uh, we I stumbled across some uh, engineers from Denmark. We decided to all join forces. We got some in- investors in and opened the first uh, retail space in Denmark, the largest in the world, actually, for reselling these small scale 3D printers. And I was then after that was open and that ran for a few years, I, uh, I left to finish my, my degree and I was a consultant for, for a few years as well. Uh, and then last year, I actually got a call uh, almost two years ago now asking if I wanted to, to rejoin. And let's just say, you know, in, in the meanwhile, things have been going quite well in uh, in my absence, I guess, uh, because now basically the company had gone from uh, selling 3D printers for the home to selling 3D printers that could print a home using concrete. And that's what I've been doing for the past two years, managing our activities in North and Latin America. So that's why I'm here in, in Miami running our offices today. And so talk about some of those early days. So when you first kind of had a group together, you have your kind of co-founders in terms of building a business that sells printers to to people. Like what what did you see in the industry that made that a compelling reason to to start a business and, and get office space and and start to to go out on on that path? Sure. So what some of the conversations we had back then, um, both during when I was there and afterwards was that 
we saw a lot of potential in the technology itself, but didn't necessarily see a good, uh, you could say, financial model for it with regard to these small-scale plastic 3D printers. Um, some of the listeners here, and, and you, Mike, might remember that if you went on Kickstarter uh, back in the days, there would be hundreds, if not thousands, of different uh, entrepreneurs doing their own small-scale 3D printers. There were so many models out there. Um, and basically, all these new entrants really drove down the, you could say, the margins on reselling these machines. But the technology itself is, is fantastic and had, had existed for, for decades before that. It was just all about what's the right use case. And some of the use cases um, were already there. For instance, uh, within uh, metal 3D printing or within dental 3D printing, they were already quite big there and are even bigger now. Uh, and you have large scale blue chip companies that invested in, in these uh, technologies back then. So we thought, okay, what about construction? Construction seemed to be quite an open market um, at the time. Not too many had ventured into that space. So we got a grant actually from the Danish government to research uh, what is the state of the art within 3D construction printing. So we did a full report by going out to different conventions, meeting with different suppliers of the technology, uh, reading a lot of, of articles uh, on the matter. So the, the conclusion of the report was there is no state of the art right now. Um, we weren't that impressed by the technology back then. However, there is a great opportunity to come in and really create uh, something fantastic using this technology. Um, this was in 15, 16, 2016. And we decided then to develop our own 3D printer to show what the technology could do. And this led to Cobot 3D printing the world's first, uh, Europe's first, I should say, uh, 3D printed building in 2017. And we called that the BOT, which stands for Building on Demand. Now, when the company then decided to actually start uh, reselling or start selling these printers that we manufactured ourselves in 2019, it became a company of buildings on demand or Cobot. And that's really how we got our company name or construction of buildings on demand, however you want to put it. And so can you talk about like what why do you need 3D printing for buildings? Like what are the the dynamics in the the market that make this a a need, right? Like construction has been around forever, like there's there are certainly um uh, a lot of different ways to build a house or a building. Like what's what were are the kind of the market conditions that make this technology compelling? Yeah, very good question. Um, I would say if, if with one word, it's it's automation. Um, as you said, Mike, the construction industry has existed for a very long period of time. Um, if we look at the efficiency gains within that period of time, and let, let's narrow it down to say from the 1950s to 2010. Um, I read a report that the... Uh, efficiency gains in, let's say, some other large sectors, uh, such as uh, manufacturing in general, had improved by, I believe, a, a, a factor of uh, 8x in efficiency in that period. Agriculture, it was a factor of 16x, 16-fold better. It might have been the other way around with those industries, but the numbers uh, speak for themselves. Whereas construction in the same period which is the world's largest industry, had improved by a factor of 1.1. So it barely moved at all in, in those 60 years. And by the way, it has been the same in the past um, 10 years since that. So the industry automation hasn't really uh, you know, happened to the same degree as it has in the other industries. And thus, this leads to a lot of, um, you know, it, it trickles down into the system. This, this leads to uh, higher construction costs, which leads to, again, higher uh, home prices, which I, I believe everybody in the world, especially the states, have experienced in the past few years. It also leads to projects taking longer times to complete uh, because it's more dependent on manpower, more construction waste, 
because it's less precise, uh, it's less automated, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of good reasons to take construction, take the construction industry on the same path of uh, automation and efficiency gains that these other large scale industries uh, have been on. And so talk a little bit about the the actual printer itself. So um, kind of uh, I've seen some videos of it and there's a lot of different um, kind of renderings on online, but essentially you're taking a building material concrete and extruding it through a, a, a nozzle. Is that kind of the, the, the main idea? Yeah, you, you got the overall hang of it. Um, it. It looks a bit like, um, what do you call it over here, like soft serve, um, <laughs> but where, where you stack it on top of each other. But really, the, the system has two components to it. One is a the printer itself. The other is the concrete mixer where you, you have the concrete uh, being produced on site. Now, the printer itself looks uh, almost like a, a cube, a see-through cube. It ha- it's a gantry-style setup. It looks a bit like a gantry. So it has three dimensions, the x-axis or the, the width, the y-axis, which is the length, and then the z-axis, which is the height of it. So you get this bounding box, and within that box, that's where you have a print head that moves around, like with the regular 3D printer, um, and that basically distributes, in this case, concrete or any kind of material really, but concrete is uh, the world's most used building material. And that's what you mix then in the, the batch plant, which is uh, on the side next to the printer. And so where in the building process does this, or like what, what sorts of buildings are you looking to, to, to work on this? Is this like a completely new design in terms of how you would think about making a building, right? Cause most like a house in the U S at least like you have, a wood frame, like probably you have probably a concrete basement. Uh, that's like that. That's the foundation. Then that's kind of wood going up, and so concrete is kind of the basement level. But what? Wh- where does the like? I, I don't know much about like larger buildings and kind of like big stone uh, concrete structures. But like, what? What sorts of buildings does is your target market, or like what? Where are you trying to? to kind of make efficiency gains and, and, and help improve the process of, of constructing a, um, a structure. Sure. So it's, for us, it's really uh, twofold in what we're addressing. One, which is uh, you could say residential houses. And then the other one is more uh, commercial or industrial use cases. Right now we have in the industry in general and, and also for Cobot specifically, seen a lot of interest for residential homes. So that's what most of our partners are using the technology for. Say you want to 3D print a 1500 square feet building or maybe 3000, maybe 4000 square feet building in one, two or or, uh, three stories, which our technology enables. The other bucket is these industrial use cases or more commercial use cases um, of which one example is with our investor, General Electric, um, they have been using the tech to 3D print these massive wind turbine bases. The idea is that you 3D print in concrete these turbine bases on site, or you could call them pedestals, and then you stack your regular steel turbine on top uh, of this printed base. And that gives you uh, extra height, which means you reach stronger winds, uh, and also more steadier winds for extra uh, energy output. So and those are the two t- typical yeah. buckets that our clients use it for. And could you describe maybe a little bit so that the author or the the listeners have a a sense of like so what does a so for residential house is is everything made of concrete so the entire walls are are concreted in or what what does what, what step in the process right because like concrete like a house is made of wood there's wiring there's plumbing there's all sorts of things so like maybe walk us through like what for what is it like a typical house construction or a residential project look like and where do you kind of fit in the process where are those like efficiency gains like of what people do now versus um with your technology and how it's set up sure um and and it's it's good that you bring that up actually mike because Right now, I would say in, in the media in general, there is this misconception that 
hey, you can, and you hear these stories from time to time. Oh, you can 3D print a house. It's going to take you 12 hours and you're ready to move in. And it's only going to be 10% of the cost. It's not uncommon to hear these stories. Um, the reality, however, is we might get there someday, right? That's, that's what we hope for. But the reality is right now that you, you basically 3D print what I would call the raw, raw house structure. So that means you're printing the walls. Um, you might be printing the, um, the foundation as well to start with and the, uh, the slabs that could be for either the, um, the floors or for the roof as well. We've actually had clients that have 3D printed a roof using this technology. But as you said, there's still a lot of other work involved in doing a home. You need electricians to do the, the conduit. Uh, you need uh, you know, wiring, plumbing. You need somebody to go in and paint it, et cetera, et cetera. And that means that I, I would say right now, you're probably addressing with this technology, you're probably addressing around one third, maybe up to 40% of the cost of a conventional home. Stick frame is quite common in the States. Um, but all these other costs are still there, still got to do the MVP. So we're actually working to integrate more and more tools to our machines to take them from being just um, 3D printers to really being multifunctional construction robots that could do more than just the 3D printing part. That could, for instance, be say you attach a robotic arm that could do plastering, it could sand down the walls, maybe it could even do like spray painting off the walls, et cetera, et cetera. Now that we have this beautiful uh, big gantry style setup, there is so much more we can do besides just the 3D printing. And it's interesting too as well that like I've seen in in other I'm here in Chicago and so like a lot of big apartment buildings are going up and residential towers and and things and one of the things that I've seen recently is there's devices that I wouldn't say they are fully automated but they certainly extend the ability of a a a manual worker to kind of lay down um let's say insulation like TPU insulation like where you're spraying it over a an extended period of time, you've got a robot like thing that is helping kind of lit do some of that lifting and direct it over over time. And and so I imagine with with this is ultimately the goal is full automation. You still need people to operate the actual equipment, but some of the gains in terms of 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 speed and cost is just you probably need less people to to do the same amount of work. Is that is that a fair assessment? Yeah, that is one of the benefits of, of automation that, that you can do more with less, right? Um, and right now, I, I get this question sometimes, um, like us or Cobot and our machinery, well, what does that mean for construction workers? Would they lose their jobs? Which is, it, you know, it's a fair question. And you, you could actually ask that for, for any new technology, really. Um, when it comes to construction specifically, uh, however, if we look at it, we're not really, it's not replacing jobs. It's actually addressing a gap there is currently in the industry. In the U.S. alone, the, there is a workforce shortage, I believe, of around half a million people in the construction industry. Mm -hmm. And that means, and anybody, any listener here, if you've done a construction project recently, uh, it most likely got delayed. Um, it actually was that before COVID, the average construction time of a project was around four months, something like that. Post COVID, it's around eight months. Um, it's very, very hard to find the contractors to do the job. Um, so this is what the technology really helps to address. Uh, a typical 3D site has uh, around three or four operators, if you're a skilled crew. And all the hard backbreaking labor is, is done by the machine. So there is no carrying around um, concrete blocks uh, or carrying around timber. The machine basically just moves around and replicates uh, the digital file that um, was fed to it. And so talk about the timing and, and trying to convince a industry that hasn't been uh, kind of changed a whole lot in the last kind of 50 to 100 years and, and talk about kind of bringing a new idea and bringing a new way to think about 
kind of construction and and, and putting materials together. Um, what sorts of uh, of pushback do you get, or what sort of kind of conversations were you having early on, and, and trying to convince people like, hey, like give this a shot? Because I imagine there's there's both like the the people that you would typically typically partner with on the job site, right? Like that that have to to buy in. There's also the architects and designers who are designing whatever it is it is going to be printed and different considerations. I imagine also like this could be someone's home. This could be where someone's work. There's um, there's safety considerations, right? Like, is it going to support its weight? How do we test it? Like, what's like, are there any differences in fire rating? All of this stuff. So, like, talk about kind of going into a, a, a established industry with a new technology. Sure. Um, proof of concepts have been super, super important for us. Uh, that's actually why we decided to do the first home back in 2017 in, in Copenhagen, Denmark, was to really show this to the world. Because as you said before, um, it's not enough to just have one technology company say, Cobot, do these buildings, right? You need the, the contractors to say yes to it. The architects, the materials companies, uh, the homeowner in the end, the user, et cetera, et cetera. And all of these have different concerns and different questions with regards to the, to the tech. So the best way you can really bring them all together uh, and understand better how we address them all is, is by 3D printing these on site, which also, you know, is a great way to really show to everybody that, that it's actually functioning. It's not just a laboratory thing that was maybe five years ago, but it, but it's out there, it's being used, and these buildings are something you can touch and feel and live in. And so as you as you start to have buildings in the field and 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 people living in them, what like what are some of the big th- things that you've learned? I mean, like you must have made kind of changes and kind of had different understanding of what works and what doesn't work. Were, were there any big insights that you've you've seen now that some some of your stuff has been in the field for uh, a few years at this point? Yeah, so a, a few things we've seen. Um, I would say one on the the design of these buildings. Uh, you know, the technology itself allows for creating almost any shape you can imagine. Right now, everybody is living in a rectangle or square home because that's what the technology, the, cur- the, the old technology allowed for. But with 3D printing, it doesn't care if it goes in, in squares, rectangles or circles, right? Or in eight, you, you can do any kind of shape you want to live in. So when we 3D printed that home I mentioned in, in 2017, we went all overboard, like it was, it was rounded, it had different rounded shapes all, uh, all around the, the perimeter. And it looked really weird. Like it had a wavy pattern on one end, almost like a snake going, uh, going through it. We learned that um, while that looks nice in theory, for the most part, at least right now, people might want to live in something that's a bit more uh, conventional, right? So it, it can definitely have some of those elements, but in the end, you know, all your furniture and your appliances, et cetera, they still have to, uh, to fit. Um, so it will have some of that, but for the most part, it will, it will still look like, you could say, a normal building. And, you know, that's also what we see our clients, uh, what they go for right now. Um, it, because we're only a tech company, we don't build buildings ourselves. So as an example, um, one of our partners in California, they recently finished their second home just a few weeks ago. And the home, you know, it's, it, it looks beautiful and you can see that some kind of technology was used for it, uh, but it's not completely over the top, right? It, it doesn't stand out way too much from, from the neighbors. It's beautiful. It's something you want to live in, uh, but it's not, you know, year 3000 in its design. And talk about that business model a little bit. So like, so you said you're a tech company and you have kind of partners that, that work with you to, to actually build the buildings. Like what? describe that a little bit in more detail and like what, who are your customers and kind of how are they kind of building a client base of, of actual buildings and, and kind of construction projects? Sure. So, so a few points, right? We, we decided from the beginning in Cobot that we did not want to do everything ourselves. 
because we can't be better at doing everything ourselves, even though we, we might want to, right? Um, so we focused on only being a technology supplier. And that means we had to do a lot of partnership partnerships to make this technology come to life. One of which is for project execution. So we sell this to a variety of, of different clients, say home builders or developers in the States and around the globe that then uses this to, to make it come to life. It also means that we're not developing our own materials, but we're actually working with large scale material, uh, construction materials companies such as Hulson and Semex, who are the world's number one and number five biggest concrete and cement manufacturers. Um, they actually also recently joined us as investors. Uh, it also means that we're working with great uh, engineering firm, uh, firms and architecture firms to really make all of this come to life. But we did not want to become into an integrated uh, like some of the others in the industry. Uh, instead, we focused very narrowly on technology and then having this very strong partnership base. And um, I, I think that's one of the reasons that we are now on, on six, like have this technology on six different continents because construction is a very, very local business. Um, you have local regulation, local um, building materials, local designs, local way of doing things in general. That's not only within, like just if you look within the States, things are very different in California from say New York, right? But compare the US to uh, Malaysia where we have a client printing, it's, it's a lot different, right? So you need these local partners to really scale the business. That's our mindset. And I imagine too, I mean, that talking about different continents, there's different weather, there's different geographies that you might have to to put this in, even in the US, right? Like building in Miami is different than building in Chicago in the middle of winter, right? <laughs> so Exactly. I mean, we, we have a client uh, an hour away from me here north of Miami uh, that's right now printing a, I think it's like a 7,500 square feet horse barn. It's very nice, the weather right now uh, down here. We also have clients um, printing up in Ontario, Canada, where right now the weather is much different. Um, so understanding those different requirements, understanding the temperatures and humidity, et cetera, is really necessary. And, and the best understanding of that are the people there that live there locally and work there. That's how we see it. Yeah. And from a technology standpoint, kind of where are some of the, the big areas that, that you're looking to improve on? Is it, if it's, is it speed kind of throughput, um, ease of use design, like where, where are the kind of the big areas where you think there's a lot of innovation still yet to be completed? Sure. I, I would say um, going a bit broader on that question, 80, around 80% 80 of the issues that our clients have, our partners have, are related to material. So the concrete mix and, and not so much the printer itself. So I think um, them having a better and better understanding of this material, which is vital for printing because you can have the best printer in the world, but you, you need the material to actually have something physical. Understanding that, being able to adjust it throughout the day to, to local uh, climate ch uh, the changes in the temperatures, et cetera, uh, is very, very important. And that's what we see once they master that, once they've been thoroughly trained in that, then the projects start coming uh, more and more rapidly. Uh, so I think that uh, on its own is, is one thing that, that needs to happen and something we're pushing for. The other thing, um, as I mentioned earlier, I believe, is uh, and what we're really trying to do is taking these machines from being single purpose to multi-purpose. So instead of them just being 3D printers, how can we address some of the other jobs on a construction side? Uh, can it do insulation? Can it do um, uh, conduit and wiring? Uh, can it do? Can it lift in plumbing elements? There is a lot of different uh, or or painting even right. There are so many different things that we want to address um, that are currently not being addressed because it is it is a a three D printer only. And I imagine too, like to your first point that. Uh, settings are critical, materials are critical. Um, I've seen plenty of 3D printers fail. If you fail in PLA, that's one issue. If you fail, have a failed build then, or something go wrong with the a concrete printer, 
you have a much much bigger mess on your hands. Yeah, you you would you would lose a lot of. You don't want to like get too big structural cracks throughout a concrete building and have to redo it all over. Um, if you want to do, let's say, a two thousand square feet building, you're likely going to use uh, forty to fifty cubic yards um, of material. Uh, so it's it's more than just you know waking up in the morning and figure that you destroyed your three uh, D printed iPhone cover in plastic. Uh, it's it's a lot bigger these operations, right? For sure. And so, I mean, uh, personally, like maybe talk a little bit about kind of what does your typical day look like um, in terms of of uh, of your role, and as for a lot of the listeners who may be interested in kind of understanding different career paths and different career careers in the added manufacturing space, maybe give them some insight on on what you do on a on a daily basis. Sure. It, <laughs> it varies a lot. My, there's not one day that, that looks like the other. Um, it, it was more predictable back when, when I was uh, in a consultancy, uh, which is great, by the way. I, I love my job and, and I love all the things that, that we do to try and push this, to, this industry. Uh, I, I could group it into different buckets. Um, the primary one that we focus on every day and most of the companies would probably say the same, so it's nothing uh, crazy, but it's like customer support. Our clients have this very new technology in their hands, and uh, they have a lot of responsibilities and, and obligations towards um, their clientele, right? So we want to make sure that they get the best customer support in the world to actually have these uh, machines be used on site. Uh, so that's that's what not only what I try to do, but our full team every day, um, whether that's uh, training, whether it's or, or it's troubleshooting or going out on site, helping them with materials, we really got to be there for them. Um, and of course, what we see is they they gradually become better and better uh, and and lead, need us less and less. But it is a new technology, so so we we try to hold their hands as much as possible. So that's one big bucket uh, that's very important to us. The other big bucket that, that we focus on is uh, growth. So getting new partners into the Cobot family. Uh, and that means you know, responding to all that reaches out to us, figuring out, okay, this is the, their use case. What are some of their current pain points and how could 3D printing address that? And, and, you know, sometimes we get completely, uh, you know, almost crazy ideas it could seem at the time. Uh, but we come together and we find out that this technology could actually solve a lot of the current issues. One example of that, let me just circle back to those um, wind turbine towers I mentioned before, Mike. So these uh, pedestals that, th that are printed by General Electric, um, the, the, the current, you could say, obstacle with the land-based wind turbines as of today is that if you, they, they're capping out at around 300 feet in height on, on average, because if you want to go higher, then you've got to go wider at the bottom. They're, they're sort of shaped conically, right? So it looks like a big cone, which means that they're wider at the bottom. But even here in the U.S., where the roads and the trucks are super, super wide, for the most part, they, they max out at sort of 15 feet. That's what you can feasibly transport. So we spoke with GE about this and, um, and, and figured, well, if we cannot ship larger modules from the, the factories, what if we instead 3D printed a larger base on site? using the 3D printers because then you would only need to transport the printers and they can you know, be stacked quite nicely on a flatbed truck. So that's what we then did. Uh, we built these initial test towers, 3D printed. The first uh, tower was around 30 feet in height or 10 meters. Um, and it was a success. It was, a, it was around 100 tons of concrete and showed that you could actually use this technology to get these turbines uh, higher. Um, and they have continued this ever since and are actually doing this um, in their, their facilities up in uh, New York. 
That's awesome. And so maybe a couple more questions. So one is where can people see some examples in person maybe of, of your technology and um, in the field? Not maybe not people building it, but maybe are there any finished projects that people can go and check out? Sure thing. Um, so we have more and more projects uh, popping up, uh, or I should say our clients have. We, we supply the technology not only in the States, um, but all around the globe. I presume most listeners here are probably from the States, so, so that's where I'm going to deep dive on. Um, we have clients that are printing in California, in Texas. They're doing right now a two-story home, which is uh, which is the U.S. first two-story, two-story 3D printed homes in uh in Canada, Ontario, Canada, Florida, they have done homes with Habitat for Humanity in Virginia, um, in in Arizona, and some more states. And there are even more coming up than I could just remember here. The easiest uh, to check these out would probably be going to our website. Uh, maybe Mike, you could like leave a link in the yeah for sure. The we always do that. or whatever. Yep. Yeah, sure. And then there's a sub page called projects and partners. And in there, you can see most of the projects that have been done using, using the tech. And uh, yeah, you could go out and, and check out these homes, see what, see if you like them. Very nice. So one last question I'd like to ask everybody. So um, you've been very successful and you've had a lot of different kind of zigs and zags in your, your career. So um, we, I'd, I'd like to ask kind of, is there a favorite book that you have or something that's given you inspiration as you kind of developed your own career and in additive and kind of business over the last uh, few years? Yeah, yes, there is. Um, very good question. Um, I, I would say the, the book that has inspired me the most um, this year, maybe in the past two years, uh, is called Why We Sleep. Um, I believe, I can't remember the author's name, but a great guy, I think maybe it might be a Mr. Walker or something like that, but it's called Why We Sleep and uh, a phenomenal book. He lists all the reasons uh, for why it's important to sleep and right, how it can really unlock uh, your brain. I, I used to work uh, like way too much and sleep way too little, um, which made me almost miserable and I didn't feel that productive. But by just putting in some more hours of sleep each night has tremendously improved my, my you could say, productivity and work and also health in general. I feel much more healthy now uh, than I did before, much more energized. Uh, so I can highly recommend that book. It's, it's really staggering um, how much good it can do for you if, if you don't get uh, seven or eight hours of, of sleep and then turning, turning that around. For sure. I'm all, all about it. And same with my kids too. Otherwise, you don't want to see them with not not enough sleep. <laughs> yeah, and I can also imagine like I don't have any kids myself, uh, but uh, Mike, it seems like you have a few, and it could, you could probably I could imagine like when they were young that you wouldn't, as a parent, get too much sleep yourself. Yep, for sure. So awesome. Well, I really appreciate you sharing kind of your story and the company story here. Uh, we'll put all the links in in the. Uh, up on YouTube and, and Spotify and, and wherever this goes out. So um, good luck with the the rest of the year. And we look forward to seeing kind of all that's come with Cobot in, in the coming months and years. Well, yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Mike, for, for having me. And uh, thank you for anybody listening in today. All right.